have this curiosity and then comes familiarity, mm -hmm. which is wonderful. Stability and familiarity, that's one of the big appeals of a long lasting relationship, of course. But when it comes at the cost of the curiosity, that is when the passion tapers off. And yes, of course, there are all kinds of other responsibilities. If children are in the mix, professional responsibilities, whatever. But regardless of what leads to it, we tend to dial down the curiosity. And it means that as each individual continues to grow and evolve, there are new aspects developed that don't actually have a place in the relationship which is all context to say that I really think the key to sustained, ongoing, expanded passion in a long-lasting relationship is making room for the new evolution of each person to be brought into the relationship. <laughs> to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. I am your co-host, Judy Alexander, and I'm here with my husband, Dr. Bruce Chalmer. Well, hello, Judy, and hello, viewers and listeners. We had a fun interview we've just completed, and we're going to show it to you shortly. And so, Judy, tell folks the title of our podcast today. It is The Intimate Marriage, an interview with Dr. Alexandra Stockwell. And that was a lot of fun. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're interested in an intimate marriage, and by intimate, she off she she means intimate like sex, mm -hmm. <laughs> that kind of intimate. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just you know, in in all actually not just sex, but in all of the ways. And of course, that's one of our favorite topics as well. Mm -hmm. um, please stay tuned for that, yes. and uh, you can check her out. Yep. Uh, in the meantime, we would like to put in a plug for this podcast. We would like you to go to um, your favorite place from which you stream this podcast and subscribe and also rate us and uh, Follow review us, us and share all that it, kind of stuff. Yeah, I guess it stuff. seems to be different on each uh, different thing. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been mentioning this and I will say it again. We have a new website that is in process. Uh, those of you, if you're interested, by the way, if you want to check out my new website, my practice website, which, you know, has all kinds of videos and uh, stuff too, brucechalmer.com has been revamped it is new it is fancy mm -hmm. it is done professionally it for looks James. Really it's, good. it looks really good and uh our ctn7.com website is being worked on as we speak and i'm thinking within another week or two we're recording this on october 7th 2022 within another week or two uh, i'll bet we'll be ready to go live with that so mm -hmm. check that out it's really uh really it's very nice on. and we want to put in a plug for the book that's been out for a couple of years, which is... Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. That book is already available, has been for a while. It's available on paperback, as I was just holding up. It's available as an audiobook where I did the recording, and it's also available for Kindle. And there is a new book that is coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, it's It's been shipped to the publisher, and yeah. it's been edited, so... Mm -hmm. Mm, it's moving months, along. Moving along. Moving along. And It'll the title, title of that book is It's Not About Communication, Why Everything You Know About Couples Therapy is Wrong. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I think you'll have fun with that book, um, wh whether or not you read the earlier book, but you'll have fun with that book as well. I will. I haven't, haven't recorded that yet. That's one of my next tasks mm -hmm. is to do the uh, recording for that, and we'll make an audio book out of that as well. So uh, watch for that. And um, of course, with the with re reigniting the spark that's already out there, uh, we would very much appreciate if you would review it mm -hmm. and rate it and let people know about it. Right, and that's available in book form, in Kindle form, and audio. And anywhere books are sold. So let us turn to our interview. You will hear Judy interviewing our guest. I mean, introducing, introducing. our guest, and then the two of us will interview her. And we will see you on the other side. Our guest today is Dr. Alexandra Stockwell. Known as the Intimacy Doctor, Dr. Stockwell is an intimate marriage expert who specializes in coaching couples to build beautiful, long-lasting, passionate relationships. She is the best-selling author of Uncompromising Intimacy, host of the Intimate Marriage Podcast, and creator of the Aligned and Hot Marriage Program. For over 20 years, 
She has shown men and women how to bring pleasure and purpose into all aspects of life, from the daily grind of running a household to intimate communication and ecstatic experiences in the bedroom. A wife of 26 years and a mother of four, Dr. Alexandra believes the key to passion, fulfillment, intimacy, and success isn't compromise. It's being unwilling to compromise because when both people feel free to be themselves, the relationship becomes juicy, nourishing, and deeply satisfying. Alexandra, welcome to Couples Therapy in Seven Words. Thank you. I'm really glad to be here and speak with both of you. Well, it's great to have you. So, you know, we know you're an MD uh, and it, it shows, and I think that'll show on the recording. I'm trying to remember if, yes, the name show on the recording. Mm -hmm. uh, so people can see that who are watching the video. Why did you transition from practicing medicine to becoming an intimate marriage expert? How did, but tell us something about your journey. Well, there are many ways to tell the story, every one of them true, but let me just say that in my mid thirties, my husband and I met in medical school. He's a physician as well. And we were married. We had three of our four children at that time. I had paid back my medical school loans and had my own small holistic practice north of Boston and basically had worked really hard for 15 years to get to where I was and thought that I would have some sense of really having arrived and enthusiasm to continue living that way practicing medicine another four decades, let's say. Mm. But I didn't have that feeling that I had unconsciously been chasing because I'd assumed I'd have it. I didn't have it. And at the time, I didn't know any doctors who had stopped practicing medicine other than due to addiction or injury, in other words, involuntarily. Mm. Now, many doctors are leaving the practice of medicine, but I didn't know anyone at the time. And so I arranged to take a year long sabbatical. And one of the things that I did really for the first time in my mature life was I did things because I felt like it. Mm. This was totally novel to me. You mean Everything... that's okay to do? It's actually, it's possible <laughs> to do if you can pull it off? <laughs> you know, it wasn't easy. I mean, we can joke about this, but everything i i'm ambitious and i obviously had achieved a lot and basically every moment i was oriented to having experiences as a means to an end that didn't mean i didn't enjoy my experiences but a lot was really a means to do what was good for my family good for my career etc good for my patients etc and so it really took a lot to shift to do things because I wanted to, good reason or not, it just felt good. And I went on a whole journey with this and explored various aspects of my life and eventually got to where the next and final frontier was sensuality and sexuality and really being able to feel and enjoy those experiences for me and for my marriage. And so I signed up for a very in-depth training that was for both lay people and people becoming coaches. And at the time, I didn't know what a coach was. That is not, I didn't join this training with any professional aspirations, but I'm curious. And so I went to the teaching lab and I felt like I'd come home. And so a lot of what really drew me into medicine, and I'm so grateful for all of my medical training and practice, but really the thing in my heart as a contribution, which is why I became a doctor, is something that I'm able to do now in coaching couples. Wow. So I guess it, it helps to have your medical background because I'm going to ask you a question about um, passion. So why does passion typically taper off with time? Is that a physiological thing? Is it an emotional thing? Um, how? What do you think? Well, there is not adequate research or data on this. So I am definitely speaking out of my own lived experience as a physician, as someone who has facilitated passion for couples, my own 26 year marriage and 
others I've learned from. And there is no physiological reason for passion to taper off. In fact, I have uh, one couple, they've been married for 51 years. She's very clear. She's having the best orgasms of her life. I have mm -hmm. this other couple in my Facebook group. They've been married for 53 years. Describe always having had a strong sex life. And three years ago, they had a sexual awakening. And I'm sharing these stories specifically because this is something that is rarely talked about. And despite all of our brilliance individually and collectively, we still mostly learn how to do relationship through modeling and imitation. That's how mammals learn and we are mammals. So mm. I wanna share these stories. And the way that I think about it is that when we first fall in love, part of that experience includes being so curious about our partner where did you get that scar? You know, did you always have a beard? What did you want to be when you grew up? Tell me how you orient spiritually, like whether it's about what kind of vegetables we ate, possible thesis topics, what countries you've been to, just the experience of being in love includes just so much curiosity about the other person. I, I, I will put in, I remember when I first met you falling in love with your yogurt. A yogurt. <laughs> you huh? yogurt. We don't even eat the same yogurt anymore, <laughs> but that, that, that you used to get. But I was just so stricken when I was falling in love. I was so enthralled with everything about you. I still am actually, but it's it's interesting because over the years it's 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 not the same kind of fascination. It's still every bit as deep and passionate. But it is. It was. I just remember that sense of I was just fascinated with your choice of yogurt. It was just amazing. You know? I remember right. that feeling. Sort of, what a beautiful <laughs> example, right? Well, I, I hadn't heard that before. Yes, I. That's but, but I want to get yeah. back to this se sexual awakening yeah, of this uh, 53 year marriage. Okay, like, well, what was that about? I will say that, but I want to just say one more thing, which is that okay. we have this curiosity and then comes familiarity, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Stability and familiarity, that's one of the big appeals of a long lasting relationship, of course. But when it comes at the cost of the curiosity, that is when the passion tapers off and yes of course there are all kinds of other responsibilities if children are in the mix professional responsibilities whatever but regardless of what leads to it we tend to dial down the curiosity and it means that as each individual continues to grow and evolve there are new aspects developed that don't actually have a place in the relationship which is all context to say that I really think the key to sustained, ongoing, expanded passion in a long lasting relationship is making room for the new evolution of each person to be brought into the relationship instead of getting used to being with one another in a particular way that if something else interests you, you either don't develop it or you do, but you don't share it with your partner. Yeah, it, it's uh, one of the things that is one of my things that I harp on in, in my first book and my my second book actually talks about it as well, the one that's about to come out. But it's the difference between stability and intimacy and how they are both necessary. But of course, what you're describing, I'm mentally mapping that on to my favorite concepts, which mm -hmm. is pretty much the same or very similar kinds of ideas that when couples favor stability, and sacrifice intimacy because intimacy can be scary. Intimacy involves tolerating anxiety rather than lowering it. And that can be scary. And so what normal couples will tend to do is not risk passion. And you know, that's I, that the the stuff you're talking about sort of fits nicely into that rubric. I, you know, mm -hmm. I perk up when I hear people saying things like, oh, I think that way too. So that, well, you think <laughs> yes, alike, uh, there you go. Yes, we do. We really do. Remember? Because yeah. I listened to your recent podcast episode, it's still not about communication. I thought, ah. oh, I completely agree. I talk about this in a different way, but I mm -hmm. totally agree with it. And I, I want to share one of the way, another way I think about it and talk about it because it's very accessible. And that is as pertains to compromise, because really mm -hmm. throughout yeah. the Western world, maybe the whole world, the most common relationship advice that is given 
is that you need to learn to compromise. You need to compromise. I enjoy, um, I spoke about this once in a Zoom setting and somebody went and got their wedding album and showed me all these wedding cards from Hallmark about how you need to compromise, but it's not just Hallmark that says that. And that's wrong. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Right? I know you do. It's such yeah. a pleasure. <laughs> And I am an advocate of uncompromising intimacy, being uncompromising, but I need to explain, I don't mean that you always get your own way. That's not the mm, sense of uncompromising, but more that where compromise is when you hold back on who you are, desires, challenges, internal truth, you don't, or even what kind of restaurant you want to go to, or what color you want the entryway of the home to be painted. It can be grand or minor, but if you don't say it, because either consciously or unconsciously you're concerned it will make your partner uncomfortable, mm -hmm. you don't want them to be uncomfortable, you end up sacrificing a part of yourself. So being uncompromising in this sense is learning how to bring all of who you are, say your truth in a way that your partner can receive it. Yeah, that that's so true. That's basically mm -hmm. the way I define intimacy mm -hmm. as yes. being, being honest with yourself and each other and in ways that ind indeed involve being willing to raise anxiety, of course. And as you point out, it doesn't mean be a jerk, right? It's like, no, you can still be compassionate and considerate, but also on and in your term uncompromising in the sense of no i'm going to be who i am even though i'm i'm a, I'm a lot of things and it keeps changing but still i'm going to be present that's what facilitates yeah because uh, i'm sure you see it in relationships where people lose themselves because they have done so much compromising because they don't want to rock the boat yes i think it's hard to imagine unless perhaps you're in the field where very competent women in particular, I mean, it happens with men too, but it has a different flavor, but women who have no problem buying, choosing which shoes they want to purchase or deciding what to pack for their children's lunch. And then I say to them, what do you want? And they really don't know. It's a question that if you're not living with it, being able to answer it gets rusty. And so that is absolutely the place to start unless you already have the answer. And all of this provides the context for me to talk about the couple with the sexual awakening. And, and I want to throw in something as you do that. I was just going to ask you about We're that. We're never going to get to this. No, wait, we are going to get to it. No, this, we I are, but it's to... a more meaningful exchange with this That's context. Right. No, I want to invoke uh, a name. He died not that long ago, David Schnarch. Do you know the oh, name? Oh, I didn't know yeah. he died, but I certainly know of him. Yeah. A couple of years, just, uh, I don't think it was COVID that he died of, but he was in, in his like early to mid seventies, which since I'm 71, I now think of as young. Yes. <laughs> and, and it's, you know, that used to be old. It's not anymore, <laughs> but no, it's, it's really sad that he died. But he, uh, he of course would tell people when he would give lectures, at, you know, he would ask the question, at what age do you think men and women respectively reach their sexual peak? Mm -hmm. And the stereotypical answers were always, oh, you know, men in their early 20s and women in their late 30s or something, you know, it was always some difference. And he would say, no, both men and women reach their sexual peak in their 60s and 70s. And it's so that's, a, I think, a nice segue into your, your story. So yes, yes tell it us is. About that couple. And it's why the work that you do and the work that I do is important, because while the sexual peak is received and is achieved in 60s and 70s, I'm 54. So I have that to look forward to. It's also <laughs> true that 50% of women over 50 are no longer having sex. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work we have to do. But in the case of this couple, who uh, she's, I don't know if he is or not, but she's in my Facebook group. And so I know what was shared there. It's not that I coach them personally. And this fits into talking about uncompromising because they discovered a particular fetish that really turns both of them on tremendously that they wouldn't have had the opportunity to even explore if they weren't willing to be uncompromising mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. i don't even think it's that important which fetish it is it's oh, more but now we're all curious <laughs> okay well it's actually fascinating because here's this woman who's been married for 53 years and i you know i can't remember there's an official term for it i love my official terms but i don't have it 
at the top of my head. Maybe you know it, where um, a husband and wife, or in any case, meaning two adults, where she nurses him and he suckles. Ah, I think I've heard of it. I don't know the. the there there's a, a name for the fetish like, that I think suckle it, yeah. is in the name. But anyway, um, it's it's a fetish which really allows a kind of unbridled nurturing energy on her part. And of course, many women are worn out and do all of the nurturing, but there's something about being able to just nurture with without without anything else to do, I would say. And I again, I don't know him. I don't I I know nothing about him, but for him at that age, it was a total sexual turn on to really be nurtured and cared for. And I have fun imagining that he's someone who had a lot of responsibility in his life and Mm -hmm. high achieving CEO manager type, although this is again, just me you know, making up stories, but that there's something about being able to receive so deeply in the suckling fetish that they had a strong sex life and didn't do anything remotely like this for 49 years. And then it just totally exploded the connection. And we can certainly understand how that might be because of all of the physiological stimulation that is inherently part of that particular fetish. Mm-hmm. And I think it, what's also interesting is you know, because they've been together so long, um, it's great that they're willing to try new things. And I think that's that comes also in an, in a long term experience that's that's mutually satisfying and nurturing is that you are willing to talk to your partner mm-hmm. um, and and in ways that you couldn't in your twenties and thirties. Yeah, and one one or the other had to initiate that conversation, mm-hmm. not knowing if the other was going to think, "Oh my goodness, you're weird." You know what what is this about? Mm-hmm. And yeah, I, I, I've heard that from uh, over the years from numbers of couples. I haven't heard that. Haven't worked with a couple of that particular one. I learned early on about a couple. I, I met a couple oh twenty some years ago, uh, who where she was into um, it was dominant submission. And this is a very powerful, take no prisoner sort of professional type woman. Is the sort of person that you didn't, you know, she'd tear you a new one as soon as look at you, you know. What she needed was to be humiliated. That's what she needed in her relationship. It actually was problematic for them because her big gruff husband, who loved her and he and she loved him, he could only pretend to humiliate her. He couldn't bring himself to actually humiliate her, and it didn't work for her. She needed somebody to actually humiliate. And what they did was they, this was in the early days of the internet, they went online, she found a guy who would send emails telling her to do these things I will not say because they're too awful. <laughs> and I just heard about them from them. And some of it landed her in the emergency room. But it was, uh, I learned a lot about that. You know, it was fascinating because once they figured that out, they had a shot at something more of a satisfying sex life. Their issue, I, I, saw them about other stuff, really, that sort of came up uh, tangentially. And then I when I was done seeing them, I don't know how it turned out. But it, they they said, gee, the work was helpful. And uh, I that was fascinating for me, I learned something about, you know, people being willing to explore possibilities that they they their partner might think was really bizarre. Yeah, and I have actually two different responses to that one is um, we I mean, what I see is people expect to grow, set goals, expand, evolve when it comes to finances, when it comes to geography, people might, you know, live someplace in their 20s and expect to be living someplace else by their 40s and so on and so forth. We expect that in our professional careers that we advance. Uh, maybe with our skill in cooking, you know, there are a lot of different areas where we absolutely expect to grow and evolve and how we do things certainly with parenting too. And somehow, for some reason, many people walk around assuming that their sex life will remain as it is in, let's say, their 30s. And if it is different, as the rest of them continues to evolve, then something is wrong. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, you need some kind of intervention or it's settling instead of looking for the creative possibilities 
that are available with the evolution of bodies and souls that naturally happens in a healthy context. So I think one of the things that, well, each of the couples we've talked about and couples with other fetishes and couples with no fetishes, that what they do to have a really robust, intimate, passionate sex life is to allow their individual evolution and collective evolution to be presenced, expressed, and explored in the bedroom. It is so interesting that there's a myth out there that if it isn't spontaneous, it isn't genuine sexually. And yet so many other experiences like the ones you're describing, you know, we, we put a lot of planning and thought and, and, you know, conversation into planning a vacation or into planning some activity and don't realize that, you know, you can do the same thing with sexual activity and have it be much richer that way. But people are afraid to do that. There's, you know, there's a, a lot of combination of mythology and just a lot of inhibition, mm -hmm. you know, that people are uh, shame being a big one and it gets in the way. Yeah, one of my most listened to podcast episodes on the Intimate Marriage Podcast is called The Delight in Scheduled Intimacy. Mm -hmm. And I've actually had a number of people listen and say, okay, well, I'll try it, you know, see how it goes. Mm -hmm. I yeah. think one of the hesitations when scheduling in that way also is pressure that mm -hmm. it, yes. it guarantees certain activities. And it doesn't, of course need to be that way. Uh, the other thing that I was inspired to say in hearing about your couple with the humiliation, well, was she had the humiliation fetish, is that in general, I think one of the things that either is lacking and tends to dehydrate a relationship or is present and really nourishes and vitalizes it is continuing to expand our range of human expression. So I refer to that in talking about being uncompromising. It also influences how I think about the five love languages, where I think if you are disconnected from your partner or really not syncing up, the five love languages are incredibly helpful to find a way to reconnect. But as far as I'm concerned, that's just the beginning because mm. the evolved and growth oriented person really can aspire to receive love on many channels and yeah, also yeah. give love on many channels. It's so interesting when people bring up the five love languages, it's almost, it's, it's a kind of parallel to when people bring up Myers-Briggs. Yes. It's like there is this sense, and, and I'm not, it's funny, we, we interviewed some friends of ours mm -hmm. who are coaches and who use Myers-Briggs, and I learned a lot from that, you know, I tend to be something of a skeptic with respect to any kind of classification system, because I'm an old, before I was a, a, a psychologist, I was a statistician, and I did my, I did my PhD dissertation actually in psychology, but I did it on a statistical technique that people often used to sort of boil things down, you know? And so I tend to be a, a skeptic on boiling things down. And the five love languages, when people say, well, this is mine and this is his, or this is hers. Mm, no, it's not. <laughs> it's like, it's a useful way of understanding multiple possibilities, but nobody is all one thing. So for the yeah. lay folks out there, what are the five love languages? I'll bet you can name them because I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm so glad you said so. So there is words of affirmation, quality time, gifts, acts of service, and physical touch. And oh, often, especially before really exploring oneself with nuance and depth, each person has one way of receiving love, which is easiest for them to feel the love in it. And so if, for example, the way that I most easily feel loved is through words of affirmation, then what would be typical is then I'm going to give my partner lots of words of affirmation, yeah. but mm, I don't know what statistics have been gathered, and I also would be suspect, but generally speaking, people are not paired with someone who has the exact same initial love language profile. So if mine is words of affirmation and my husband's, let's say, is physical touch, 
when I am feeling loving towards him, I'm going to tell him what a wonderful man he is and how much I love our life and what an awesome haircut he has and whatever. And like, it's not problematic, but he's not going to feel loved in the way he would if I would just give him a hug and not say anything. Mm -hmm. Or and indeed, it, if you say those things and give him a hug. But the, you know, because it's not that those things are worthless to, you know, people don't just have one love language, but indeed, yeah, people will tend to a, a something that tends to be primary for them. And we had, we had a guest, uh, was it Susan Bratton, I think. Oh. I, I'd heard, I, uh, you know her, yeah. I do, um, she's a spicy lady. She is a spicy lady. <laughs> it was a wonderful. fun, it was a fun <laughs> interview for us to do. And one of the things she talks about is the difference between the golden rule and the platinum rule. And the golden rule is what we, everybody learns. It's like, well, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Well, love languages is a good way of understanding. No, the platinum rule is do unto others as they would have you do unto them. <laughs> uh, and because it may not be the same. Yes, if you're if you're wanting words of affirmation and your husband wants touch, you know, you give him touch and he should give you words of affirmation. That's kind of the understanding of love languages. Again, I I, anytime I talk about a classification scheme, there's part of me that wants to object to myself. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but don't take well, that too the seriously. The way that yeah. I navigate that is that I think when couples are disconnected, the love languages without caveats from you or me are a mm. fine way to find their way back to one another. But mm -hmm. I really think it's just the beginning because I think uh, each human being is worthy of expanding into expressing love and being able to receive love in whatever form it comes i think of it a little bit like with diets that of course you know there's keto and vegan and paleo and mediterranean and eat right for your blood type and like there are all these different macrobiotic that that's a Glass oh, from the past, movie. right? <laughs> but but the thing that is very clear is that if someone is eating the standard American diet, whichever diet they do is going to bring attention and more health to them. But that doesn't mean that all of those diets are equal in yeah. long lasting overall health, but they mm -hmm. are all perfectly equivalent starting places. And so I think of that with the five love languages and any other classification like erotic blueprints. I don't know if that's something you're familiar with, but nope. that's like Never the really love know. languages, but in erotic styles. I'd be happy I, to tell I you about saw, those yeah. too. I saw but, a reference to it. I'm wondering if I, when I was looking at your stuff, if I saw that, I don't think no, so. No, no, I don't, I don't else. have yeah. that there. I just, it's another classification, which is a starting point for self inquiry, self awareness, and something worth revealing to your partner. And that's when the party begins. It's not mm -hmm. through identifying with a classification. Yeah, yeah. This might be a good time to segue to our listener letter, I think. I think it is. Yeah. So you ready, Alexandra? I'm ready. Bring it. <laughs> okay, so this comes from Frustrated in Phoenix, who writes, Dear Bruce and Judy, Bob and I have been married for 28 years. We got married late in life. I was 40, which makes me 68, and Bob is now 79 years old. We have two grown sons who no longer live with us. We're both retired, are relatively healthy, and fortunately, we don't have financial worries. There is an 11 year age difference that is becoming more apparent with each passing year. Our sex life is non-existent and not just sex. Bob isn't even willing to kiss, hug, cuddle, or be affectionate in non-sexual ways. I am growing increasingly frustrated. He was taking Viagra a few years ago, but he's worried about its effects on his heart, even though he doesn't have heart trouble. I do masturbate and use sex toys. I've asked Bob to participate with me. For example, I've asked him to use the various toys to stimulate me. He wants no part of it. He doesn't mind that I use them. He just doesn't want to be part of it. I don't want a roommate. I want a husband. I understand he's older and may have lost his sexual desire, but I see this as a rejection of me and not wanting to please me. 
I'm not going to split up at this stage of the game, but I also don't want to live the rest of our lives with a man who doesn't want to touch me. I'm still attractive and in good shape. I've thought of taking a lover, but that goes against everything I believe. How can I get the sexual and physical satisfaction I crave? Well, that is a self-aware person with a very comprehensive question. So there's no easy response which involves asking more questions. So mm. I honor this woman for being so comprehensive in really all the relevant matters. And the one thing that I'm interested in is why he's so unresponsive. Mm. Because the situation, never mind the age difference, that really doesn't contribute to anything I'm going to say, but it is a a common phenomenon that women are interested in having sex and husbands lose their libido we'll just say and very often it's not actually that they're not interested in sex or that they don't find their women attractive anymore that's one of the things women often are concerned about that oh maybe i'm not aging well obviously jane knows that's not the situation with her but it is something many women are concerned about but really the thing that most often drives men pulling back from sex with the decades is performance anxiety, mm. feeling yeah. like they're gonna lose their erection or even if they're not, that they don't know how to give their woman extraordinary pleasure in the ways that they want to. And it's hard for women to sometimes comprehend that it's actually less painful not to have sex than to have sex and possibly disappoint her. Mm -hmm. And so just disappointing her at the pass is easier to navigate. So that's one thing. Another thing that I'll say is that the sympathetic nervous system is the one that governs fight, flight, freeze or faint, stress and anxiety. And the parasympathetic nervous system is where we relax and are calm and have access to pleasure and erotic energy. So anyone who has any kind of anxiety about how the sex is going to go well sometimes creates a self-fulfilling prophecy because those concerns uh, already restrict things. So the thing that I would encourage most is to find the way to uncover what is actually happening for Bob. And that's not likely to happen by her just asking because there's too much history and it's not gonna feel like a pure question. It's gonna feel like a judgment or an accusation. Mm -hmm. So really to discover how to ask him what his experience is in a way where he's safe enough to actually say so. So is it that he doesn't know how? Does he have shame? Does he, like, I don't know, does he have some arthritis in his hands and he's concerned about using the toys? Like, does he not want to learn something new sexually? Um, with all respect for the fact that you would say it's not about the communication, I think the thing that needs to happen is communication. Oh, yeah. There I don't is... disagree with that, by the way. Okay. Yeah. There's a... <laughs> I'm not saying people shouldn't communicate. I'm I know, I know. I'm, how, I'm practically flirting with you. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I know that. But yeah. <laughs> um, there's a way in which she needs to be able, she needs to find the way to ask the question so that he actually is safe enough to figure it out if he's not mm. already conscious and say so. And with that information, then they can collaborate and creatively determine maybe he needs to take a little course on how to use sex toys. Mm. Maybe she needs to guide him demonstrate like or maybe actually it's not about sex toys but until we know what's holding him back 
it's very hard to make a recommendation about how to overcome that thing. Yeah. So yeah, it's my, interesting, isn't it? That this is one of those situations where the problem could be indeed if he doesn't, if he's simply not willing to talk about it. And it's very difficult for her to raise the issue because she she is taking it personally and it's very difficult not to. Yeah. And so that becomes, you know, naturally my gut is saying, oh, this is stuff of couples therapy, you know, or coaching or something where, where they're actually both involved in the conversation with somebody who isn't freaking out. Because to the extent that she's freaking out and asking him, it's going to stimulate him to freak out and they're not going to get anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and the other thing that I would say directly to Ms. Frust Mrs. Frustrated is you have an incredible opportunity to not feel rejected, to mm. realize that you are both the driver and the navigator, and you always have been of your own sensuality and juiciness and robustness. And there is such a beautiful part of the sexual journey of really realizing having a great lover is wonderful but that's not what creates the erotic energy in you you do and so to really um enjoy enjoy your own sensations enjoy dancing around him even if he doesn't look up from the newspaper if he's 79 and reading a newspaper you know there's a way in which something delicious is available it's, it's like there's fruit on the table and she's not eating it and that is not a complete solution but it is something that i invite you to do mm. but, oh whoever has contributed this question yeah okay uh, frustrated frustrated in phoenix, in phoenix. well <laughs> well that's right. funny we usually we change the names anyway of course but usually she didn't send a she name. didn't send a name so <laughs> we went with what she said but anyway whoever you are um hope that is helpful uh, and uh, let us know uh alexander tell people if they want to get you know get in touch with you or look at your your programs and things like that what what's your website it's alexandrastockwell.com and from there you can find my book called uncompromising intimacy my podcast the intimate marriage podcast I have lots of different ways to work with me and all of that is at alexandrastockwell.com. That's great. And we'll put that in the, the notes uh, with this podcast and as some, well. And some good podcasts. I've been listening to your podcast. So enjoy Alexandra's podcasts. Indeed. Well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. What a pleasure. And uh, I love having somebody else in the world who it's like very few roads actually lead to Rome but you're on a road that leads to Rome and I'm on a road that leads to Rome where Rome is the way that we both see so much or all three of us see so much potential and hope and passion and gratification available in long lasting relationships. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as we enjoyed interviewing Dr. Alexandra. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, Dare I mention that one of the things that happened after we stopped recording is you can check out her podcast because we might be on it. Let uh -huh. me just say it that way. I don't want to <laughs> promise things that haven't happened yet, but uh, we were invited, so which mm -hmm. is delightful for us as well. Uh, so um, we would like to uh, put in another word here for the book that started this podcast, right? which is... Reigniting the Spark, Why Stable Relationships Lose Intimacy and How to Get It Back. Available in all the various formats. Uh, the audiobook has proven quite popular, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and well, I did who the... wouldn't love listening to you? Well, aren't you yeah, sweet? I hope, I hope <laughs> folks, you would enjoy that as well. The one thing you know about when I do my own, you know, recording of my own book is that mm -hmm. I believe what I'm saying. And I mm -hmm. not only believe it, you know, it's funny. Occasionally, you'll hear a, uh, an audiobook where it's not that they didn't believe it; they didn't quite understand it. You know, mm. it's like, ooh, you know. Usually, they're they're quite good because they, you know, yeah. they audition people. But anyway, <laughs> at least you know that I know what I'm talking about in <laughs> in, in my own book. And I'm going to be doing the same thing for the next book that you should watch for. The next book is called "It's Not About Communication: Why Everything You Know About Couples Therapy Is Wrong." 
uh, and that will be coming out sometime in the next couple of months, so you can watch for that. And the place you can check for the news about that, and in fact, you'll be able to sign up for uh, a notification, sign up for a newsletter or a, uh, you know, on our mailing list, mm -hmm. is ctn7.com. And perhaps by the time you're seeing this, because you know some of you are watching this right after we recorded it on October 7th, 2022. Some of you are perhaps watching this months down the line. We will, within a couple of weeks or two, three weeks of this time, we'll have a new website for our podcast, ctn7.com. It's going to be really nice, way better than our old website. And I've been saying this to folks, you know, if you happen to be seeing this soon after recording it, feel free to check out our old website mm -hmm. for old time's sake. And just to notice when you see the new one, it's like, wow, that's nicer. <laughs> <No>? <laughs> Let's and, hope so. And I don't mind, you know, I don't mind admitting, I guess, <laughs> to anybody who really knows websites, they'll say, oh, and we know who designed that one, right? <laughs> yeah, it was me. The new one, we're having a pro do, and mm -hmm. she's quite wonderful, and it really yes, is, is turning on So I hope you'll check that out. And if you have any questions for me and Bruce, uh, much as frustrated and Phoenix had, you can email us. You can email Bruce at ctn7.com. Judy at ctn7.com or just visit our website ctn7.com and if you'd like to be on our program we also have a place on ctn7.com where you can sign up to be a guest on our show. And that is already there even on the old website and it'll be even nicer on the new website. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty much the same link though. It'll send you to a link to our calendar uh, where you'll get to pick a time and in, in accordance with that we'll also ask you, gee, what do you want to talk about and see if we think you'd be a good fit for the show. And we have had um, most of our guests, including uh, Dr. Stockwell, um, Alexander Stockwell, mm -hmm. have contacted us asking to be right, on the show, right. and uh, you can do that too. And if you have um, a topic that you would like us to talk about, even if you don't want to be on the show, you can suggest that as well. Please do. And so I think we've covered what we need to cover in I our think little we outro have. here. Great. Yeah. And so until next time, remember be kind, don't panic, and have faith. Mm -hmm.